everyone, I'm Nicole Kupchik and I'm here with Joel Green and welcome to 10 Minute Tidbits. So today we're going to bring you information on fluid resuscitation and sepsis. So I know just probably if you work in a hospital, you've dealt with a septic patient. True or false? Oh, totally. Yeah, I mean we see sepsis everywhere. And so, so anyway, all right, I want to talk about specifically about fluid resuscitation. So there was a, a study that's published back in 2017 and it was a study where they evaluated patients and kind of outcomes a gigantic database and what they did was they looked at fluid resuscitation the amount of fluids patient got patients received and equated that to kind of their outcomes and so this was done by Paul Merrick and I don't know if you guys are familiar with Paul Merrick he was the vitamin C uh, the, the physician that um, uh, did the vitamin C study so I mean I love him he's an amazing guy and so I think this study was actually really really important to be published and so one of the things they found that when patients received five liters or more of fluid, it was associated with much higher mortality in the first 24 hours. Okay, so you're like five liters. <laughs> we give our patients like 10 liters. Right. And maybe you do, but I think this study really, we have to take pause and back up and ask the question, first of all, do patients need fluids and sepsis? So, absolutely. Yeah, they need yeah. fluid, absolutely. But the problem is, when do you stop? Because you all know, so if you think about sepsis, what's the issue with sepsis? You get massive vasodilation, dilation, and what happens to capillaries because of inflammation? They leak, fluid goes everywhere. So yeah. fluid third spaces. And for a lot of patients, fluid third spaces in the lungs, and they go into ours, they have pulmonary issues, or they go into organs, and they end up with organ dysfunction. And so we've really got to ask the question, A, does my patient still need fluid? And B, how do you know that they're responsive to the fluid? Okay, so the, so a couple other little details about the study. So tell me about the the, so, the cost yeah, so around too much this, fluid. Like you look at this, and they were talking about anything over five liters was about a thousand dollars a bag. So you figure like one bag of normal saline, one bag of LR was like almost a thousand dollars. It wasn't because the bag cost that much. No, yeah, no. It's really to the complications that that bag cost. Yeah. So whether it put them into renal failure, put them into uh, pulmonary failure, uh, liver failure, whatever yeah. happened to that leader beyond the point of responsiveness is when they got into trouble. Yeah. So major complications related related to over resuscitation with fluid. Okay. Um, and so, and then, I, well, I'm probably going to do another segment on which fluid to give. I, I need to do that, actually. And I'll talk about um, saline and versus LR. That's not the point of this. The point of this is when do you stop, right? Okay, so let me ask you the question. this question. How do you know your patient needs fluid? So, always the answer is when I say they're hypotensive, I always want to give them fluid or a presser. That's yeah. what I always want to do. Okay. Yeah. So when they're hypotensive, but how do you know they specifically need well, fluid? I know the right person? answer. The right answer is yeah. I did a PLR, I did a PPV or a stroke volume assessment is the yeah. right answer. Yeah. The bad answer is because they need fluid. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think that's kind of the practice we've gotten into. We're like, oh, they're tachycardic, oh, they're hypotensive, let's give more fluid. But really, think about the issues with sepsis. In sepsis, you have massive vasodilation and because of inflammation, you get capillary leak. leak. So where does fluid go? It's all third space. It yeah. goes everywhere. It goes into the lungs. It goes into organs. They end up with organ uh, dysfunction, and these patients end up with higher mortality. And so when you're giving fluids, one of the how do you know the patient is responsive to them? Well, their stroke volume goes up. That's how you know their heart function improves. And let me just ask you this question then: What are we all routinely doing to assess them? And we used to do CVP, which is central venous pressure, yes, which is not what we're doing anymore. Yeah, no. uh, and there have been studies since, uh, really good studies for almost 20 years now, showing CVP, central venous pressure, does not tell you if your patient's a fluid responder. Um, it's you know, it's 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 as good as flipping a coin. So so don't use CVP to guide fluid management. You really shouldn't. Yeah. So in that case, we're going to be using newer th things we've had for a while, like yeah. PPV, pulse pressure variation. So you need an art line for that. So it just says, so it's either called pulse pressure variability or stroke Pro volume variability, depending on what brand uh, yeah. of device you're using. But that, with that, you need an art line. And, um, and then there's a lot of limitations to that as yeah. well. Um, you know, your patient has to be mechanically ventilated, ATCs for closed chest, bus, closed chest yeah. regular rhythm, yeah. right? Okay, so there's a lot of limitations yeah. to using pulse pressure variability to decide if your patient needs fluid. Although you could use those technologies yeah. 
and just look at the, the stroke volume or cardiac index. And with a passive leg raise or by giving fluid, if their index goes up or their um, their stroke volume goes up by at least you know 10 percent, that's probably an indicator that they will be a fluid responder if they're not ventilated, you know, um, and have all those conditions. So that would be another thing. I mean, some of your docs too out there may be using ultrasound to look at their IVC or look at their yeah. ventricles, which is a better way too. I mean, there they're getting direct visualization of whether or not these vessels are compressible. So that's a way, it depends yeah. on how advanced your physician team is on that. Yeah. On using ultrasound. So they're basically with breathing, what they're, what they're assessing is with breathing, does the IVC collapse, at which would indicate your patient likely needs fluid if they have collapsibility of their inferior um, some other technologies. Uh, the big hot one right now is bioreactants. So bioreactants, they put these little electrodes above and below the heart, and um, it measures stroke volume. And you can either do a passive leg raise, and Joel and I are going to do actually do a video yeah. in the future on passive leg raise technique of how do you do it. But um, you can use passive leg raise or just give the patient fluid, and if their stroke volume uh, goes up by at least 10%, they're a volume responder. They need fluid. Okay, and then what else can um, we, There's other devices out there, some that use your A-line to do that. Okay. Um, so those companies are out there as well as like Edwards and Linco, they yeah. have devices that can do that. Um, oh, the little digit devices. Oh yeah, those there's ones digits. that go on your fingers yeah. and they can measure as well. The, um, they measure cardiac output, yeah. stroke volume continuously. You can look at things like urine output, but unfortunately in sepsis, yeah. urine output is a very poor predictor of fluid response. Super poor. Because, so is blood pressure right. and heart rate, you guys. Because they've often gone into kidney failure at that point, um, so they may not be able to tolerate fluid in order to get rid of the fluid. Yeah, and then one other technology you can try is end tidal CO2. And so again, you would use the passive leg raise technique or just give fluid, and if they've got an end tidal CO2 increase by at least 5%, that's an indicator your patient will be fluid responsive as well. So, but the bottom line, I, and I think the study by Paul Merrick is so valuable and that we need to stop blindly yeah. giving fluids. It and is that's for the trauma crazy. nurses too. Oh, oh, trauma nurses, you're getting a little diss yeah. here by Joel. Not, not a everything diss, gets not fluid. Diss. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, 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 I mean, fluid is not benign, right. and you you have to think of fluid as a drug. Okay, so it is a drug. Think of it that way, and we just we can't overdo it. No. You know, we've got to just get the fluids right. There's this anesthesiologist I met at the Society of Critical Care Medicine a couple years ago, and one of the things I love that he said was, in sepsis, you need to give just enough fluid and not a drop more. And I think it's really true, right. you know? But, um, but you know, there's always the, the issues of under resuscitation. Yeah, there is. And it, there's a lot of mortality associated with that as well. Yeah. Um, that if you never met your goals, your patient had just yeah. as bad as if you went over your goals. Yeah. So. Yeah, and it's um, there's this thing called the uh, the Bellamy curve, and basically what it shows is you've got to get the fluids right. But if you under resuscitate, those patients die quick. They die early within the first 24 hours because they're hypoperfused with high lactates and things like that. But if you over resuscitate patients, that's the slow, long, yeah. painful death because of all the organ dysfunction they get. So we've got to get the fluids right. Yeah. Okay, Joel, what else you want to say? Um, yeah, so there's a lot of changes to the sepsis guidelines. If you haven't seen them, you need to listen to Nicole's uh, sepsis classes. They're awesome. I highly recommend oh, yeah, them. Yeah, coming probably yeah. in April, I'll actually um, um, have a recorded course that I'll have available yeah. online. Um, but there's yeah. a lot of changes. I mean, we, we talked about the CDP thing. Uh, there was no more steroid usage. Yeah. Um, there was big changes that happened in the last IHI update. So make sure you check those out. Um, this study was very cool because it also delineated patients, not only their complications, but patients who had those complications prior to their sepsis. Yeah. So that was what was interesting in this yeah. study. So. And I'll put um, the reference up in the, the uh, link, or in the um, kind of comments below, so I'll have the reference for you guys. So, all right, any any ending comments here? I think so, other than enjoy Seattle. Oh, look at our beautiful yeah. view in Seattle. That's why we love here in Seattle. Especially on a sunny day. On a sunny day in the winter. We yeah. Love it. So, all right. Well, thanks for tuning in to 10 Minute Tidbits. I'm Nicole Kupchuk. This I'm is Spring. And we're out. Yep.